sport has the power to change the world. Welcome to our first episode of the Power of Sports in 2018. It's that power of being able to chart the story of sports' ability to do good, not just in South Africa, but across the world. I'm Jean Smythe, your host of the series, but during the course of the upcoming year, you'll hear from other guest presenters as we continue in our journey to bring you some of sports' most inspiring stories. With the upcoming Laureus World Sports Awards in Monaco, a jewel in the annual calendar, a final list of nominees for that event has just been released, and we look forward to hearing your feedback on who will follow on from the likes of last year's winners. South Africa has Casta Semenya nominated as Sportswoman of the Year and we hear from her exclusively in this episode. South Africa's women's football team, Banyana Banyana, are currently being led by one of the game's sharpest minds and recently the team was named as Africa's Best as we sit down with coach Desiree Ellis to find out just what has led to their success. And a previous guest, Nick Lamini, has proved to be an inspiration to many. He's joined Team Dimension Data for Kubeka as a full world tour rider in 2018, getting his season underway early at the Tour Down Under. He speaks to us about the challenge ahead before he literally scorched the field in donning the King of the Mountains jersey. Welcome to the show. Well, one of the year's sporting highlights, now a month or so away, we'll see Monaco once again play host to Galaxy of Stars at the annual Laureus World Sports Awards. Usain Bolt was among those that captured the imagination last year that included World Sports Greatest Selfie. For a reminder of that, head over to our social media feeds to refresh your memory. A year on, and with Bolt formally stepping aside, the likes of Lewis Hamilton, Roger Federer, Chris Froome, Cristiano Ronaldo, Mo Farah and Rafa Nadal will be looking as being named as the world's best sportsman. While among the women, Casta Semenya's career has certainly been one that's always been in the spotlight, long touted as being the athlete to break the almost impossibly difficult 800 meter world record, she's continued to edge closer and closer to that mark while at the same time dominating her event. As a result, she's been nominated for the World Sportswoman of the Year in Monaco, up against the likes of Serena Williams, Alison Felix and Katie Ledecky. The soft-spoken South African gave this exclusive insight to the power of sport and what the nomination means to her. This is an amazing feeling. I feel privileged and honored to receive an opportunity like this. And I'd like to thank God uh, for life, for this precious um, talent. Also, my parents for giving birth uh, to me. Also, this is for my people and my team. Obviously, people from South Africa, all over the world, for cheering me, uh, you know, doing all these things. I'm looking forward to, to the awards. And also, I feel blessed to be nominated amongst uh, the best ladies in the world. And congratulations to each and every nominee. Uh, may God bless them. And as I don't forget, uh, Norias, for the recognition. While well, other categories include the team of the year, Real Madrid, the French Davis Cup team, or the Mercedes Formula One team vying for that award, Fedra and Valentino Rossi headlined the comeback of the year category, won by Michael Phelps last year. And of course, there are those that inspire the sports person with a disability and also the best sporting moments of the year for which the public voted for that shortlist. We'll be in Monaco to bring you all the news on the night from the Principality, as well as some of the behind-the-scenes action too, so you don't want to miss it. There's a new name on cycling's biggest stage. Nick Glamini, who's shot to prominence with his attacking riding in the mountains of the opening stages of the Tour Down Under, has had everybody talking, not least about his journey to becoming a pro, but because of his style of riding and calm demeanor on and off the bike. The young Cape Tonian, who has also been a member of the Laureus Yes program, tells us how he's feeling ahead of his first World Tour ride with Team Dimension Data for Mubeka. So I'm here at the People Choice uh, Classic. It's a short one-hour criterion. Uh, our first World Tour race for the season, so quite excited, but been quite nervous this whole week since I got here in Adelaide. But to be nervous, quite normal. So <laughs> uh, excited at the same time, but hopefully the team can really do well and. Um, I hope to do my best and help the guys as much as possible. And um, thinking ahead of the, the week for the uh, Santos Tour Down Under as well. Uh, I've trained specifically for, for the tour, so hopefully everything goes well. Team leader will be Tom Jarder Slachter. He's going re- really well at the moment, so it would be nice to be there and, and give him all I can and 
get a nice victory because he has won the race in 2013, so it would be nice to, to repeat it again. Banyana Banyana's build-up to the Rio Olympic Games in 2016 was one of the most impressive in their history. Under Dutch coach Vera Pau, the team were highly organised, dynamic and acquitted themselves well in coming up against some of the top nations in the game. After the Games, though, Pau opted to explore other opportunities. And so, there was a concern in some quarters that that momentum that she generated would be lost, and so with it the hopes of reaching the 2019 World Cup. But step forward Desiree Ellis, an assistant to power and former player, who took on the challenge and has continued the team's upward trajectory. Banyana went on to win a tightly contested Kasafa Cup, seeing Ellis win the competition both as a player and a coach, a unique double, and the result in the national team being named as the continent's best in 2017 at the annual CAF Awards. Well, the Power of Sport caught up with her in Cape Town and started by asking her about their most recent recognition. I'm really very excited. It was a bit overwhelming. We knew that we had a great chance of winning the award, but you know how awards are, you never know what, which way it can go. And while watching it live on television, when it eventually happened, uh, me personally, I was overwhelmed. I'm sure a lot of the players were. Banyana has been nominated a few times. This is the first time that they've won the award. And I think it's on the back of a very successful Kosafa Cup. I think it's a collective effort by a couple of coaches prior to me being the coach. Um, Joseph Nkonza, Makalakalani, Mashilo and, and Vera Pau. And obviously Banyana players that have come before. Also the, the coaches in the Sassa League. Um, the players in the Sassa League, they are the ones that help us with our selection. And then we cannot forget, you know, our sponsor, um, Cecil, who's just renewed. He's been fantastic in uh, not only uh, supporting Banyana, uh, but also the league and obviously Safa. Because if they don't, uh, you know, put you in international competitions, you would not be up for this award. So all in all, it's been a collective effort. But I think a big thank you should also go to the support staff. Those are the behind the scenes guys, the doctors, the physios and that fitness trainers, uh, you know, assistant coaches and analysts because they do the work behind the scenes and they are not the ones that get seen, but a lot of the work comes from them. So at, at the end of the day, really, it's an award for South African uh, women footballers and they should all feel proud that they played a part in this. You are so <coughs> humble in terms of your approach, you praise players, support staff. But is there a quiet moment that you were able to just take real pleasure in the year that, that you had in terms of your position? You know, being a former player yourself and then going through the coaching ranks as well, it must have been a real personal highlight for you. Well, you know, you, when, you, when you coach or when you do anything, you don't really do it for accolades. But when it does come, you appreciate it. And I always believe that hard work pays or smart hard work pays. Mm. And um, that, is, that is the reward for that. And yes, quietly you think that, yes, that, that's fantastic, but you also feel that um, there's a lot more to be done, a lot more that can be done, um, because we all know the ultimate prize is qualifying for the World Cup. We've been to back-to-back -back Olympics, uh, London 2012 and Rio 2016, but I think the biggest one of all would be to qualify for, for the World Cup. And I think that's, that's what we're working towards. And... Um, like I say, thankful and grateful and blessed that we, that that I could be part of, of something like this. We cannot uh, ride on it too long because it's a lot of uh, hard work to be done. The national women's team being fated at the moment <coughs> certainly uh, through our work, Glorious, you're obviously uh, linked to the foundation here in South Africa as well, though. And I've met some amazing young women in particular who are so passionate about the game. What what do you feel the state of the women's game overall is in the country at the moment? Well, we have, uh, we have 144 teams playing around the country. And in each province, we have uh, a league of 16. And um, sometimes you, you don't get the strength versus strength, though, but they, you do get an opportunity to select. And a lot of the players that have come through that have been successful in the, in the Banyana team. In a lot of the provinces also, you have a regional league, which is the feeder to the Sessa League. And you also have in a lot of the LFAs, which is the local football associations, you have uh, under 13, under 15 and under 17 girls football. And not forgetting the school's football. So uh, there's still a lot that can be done. 
um, you you always think that yes there is development but there is never enough and uh, we all need to put our, our, our heads together and we all need to start working to make it even better because the onus is on each and every one of us to, to put the work in and uh, there is talk of a national league in 2019 and I think uh, that will take Banyana to a different level. From a coaching perspective there are a lot of there's a lot happening this year can you just talk us through 2018 what the goals and objectives are for the team? Well we have the Sweden game first and obviously it's about the result but it's also about the performance because uh, you also want to see where you're at with your performance and what still needs to be tweaked then we go to Cyprus playing in the Cyprus Cup which is uh, playing against uh, countries that are that are higher ranked than you which gives you that opportunity and also playing countries that are higher ranked also gives Banyana the opportunity to improve their ranking and in that way for the players to be scouted to play in the better leagues in the world and that will obviously benefit uh, Banyana Banyana even more. Then we have the qualification for, for AFCON. Uh, we play the winner of Swaziland uh, Lesotho, which uh, with all due respect we should beat them. And then all guns blazing for preparation for AFCON and uh, the aim obviously is to win AFCON. We've never won it before. We feel that we have the capabilities of doing that, but if we do fall short, we want to make sure that we get into that three places um, that will go to the, the World Cup. So that is the plan this year. And at the end of the day, you want the best players to play for the national team. So it's a consist, continuous looking out for players um, and, and the gaps that we have in between where we're not playing. Uh, we try and regularly interact with the coaches um, and also give the players individual programs so that when we do have a camp, they, the, the, we're trying to maintain what we have and improve so that they're not that far behind. Mm. So it's a, that's what we've done over the last year. Um, we'll also continuously try and do that over this year. If sitting across from you at this table wasn't <laughs> a rapidly aging, middle-aged man, but a <laughs> 10-year-old, aspirational, young South African girl who wants to play for you, or for your team, for the national team one day, what would your message be to them, Des? Well, I, I was fortunate enough in last year, uh, a 10-year-old inboxed me on, on Facebook and said she as aspirations of playing for the national team. That's a 10-year-old. So I went out and went to watch her play. And uh, I, I think I was excited, but I think she was very excited that I actually took the time out to go and watch her play. And I think that is important, you know. And uh, we still regularly chat on, on, on Facebook. You see, before, a parent would most probably say girls don't play football. But I think it has evolved. Um, when I was playing in the national team, 90% uh, of the players were unemployed. Now, 90% of the players have degrees, and that is the opportunity that football gives you. You get a scholarship to go to a varsity, be it local or overseas, and uh, even the varsity cup in women's football has become extremely big. You also have the World Student Games, which the players go to, so those opportunities, it's not just about football, but it's about getting an, an, an education. It's also about possibly being scouted to play professional football, and those are opportunities that are out there for, for, for young kids. So. My biggest message is find that one thing that you're good at, pursue it with all you have and uh, make use of the God-given talent that you have because not everybody's going to be a professional footballer. And, and always, always do the best, be the best because you never know who's watching. In our next episode, we find out why football boss Andre Vias Boas undertook driving in the Paris Dakar rally, although not all went quite to plan. So, a uh, lifelong ambition of mine to one time do the Dakar rally like my uncle did it in '82 and '84. So, it's kind of been a, a passion of mine. My, my initial idea was to do it in a bike. Uh, you know, eventually, more sensible people told me to, to calm down a little bit and, um, and do it in a car, which is safer. So, uh, you know, it's been a passion of mine for, for such a long time and I found almost the numbers right. It's the 40th edition, I'm 40 years old, my uncle did it at 42 and, uh, and I wanted to, to do it, to fulfill this dream. Please subscribe, rate and share not only on this episode but also the series. You can find us on iTunes and on Omni Radio. So please do send us your comments and questions via Facebook and Twitter and be sure to follow us on Instagram. Until next time, cheers.